We got Les on the line. Les, how are you doing today? All right, David. How about yourself? Hey, really good. Good. Really I hear good. you guys trying to uh, make common sense out of the booking on Nitro. And failing. Is it called <laughs> a Frivolous Pursuit by Dave Meltzer? <laughs> <laughs> we're bound and determined. We're bound and determined to to make to make that show make sense. And um, they had a good show, but that doesn't necessarily mean that it all made sense. I know. Yeah, they 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 have put together a more solid show. There's no two ways about it. But yeah, but okay, okay. I mean, it was. But you know, someone like emailed me this morning and just goes, you know, that was a really good show. And but if you took all the Ric Flair segments out, it's the same show it's been. <laughs> It's just that damn Ric Flair. You know, it's so funny. It is is like, I, I you know, people will go to me and just go, you know, he's he's 51 years old, and you know, is it time for him to retire? But I mean, the whole thing is, is like, but it's like he's the only one. He's the only one who can make an angle get over. It's it's amazing, and then, yes, oh, I know. And you know, I'm like you. I was just, I was just reading the Observer this morning, and uh, please put trunks and a T-shirt on him. I mean, in his, in his uh, tailor-made slacks just makes no sense whatsoever. Yeah. That's just, you know. And, and it just, I don't know. He deserves better than that. I mean, just his reputation. Yeah. You, you know, but he's now the 15 time, 15 time. I can't say it that many times, can I? <laughs> No, and, and, and not only that, not only that, he had probably you know him and Jared had a, had a had a very good match last night, and he did it with one arm. Right. I mean, it's like it's like it's like he's 51 years old, and he's got one arm. And granted, you know, he, he, he wasn't working with a bum this time, but he had like you know he had the best match on Nitro, and God, I don't know when was the last because they they rarely have good matches on Nitro. Yes, you're right. You're absolutely right, and he did. I I was that's what I was sitting there following was the fact that I knew he was favoring the arm, the shoulder. And watching him protect it, and yet still, you know, give as much as he could. And uh, again, you got to go back and say this guy is a consummate professional. You know what else? I actually believe he's going to have a. Now, this may be this may be completely ridiculous, and I may end up being, looking like the biggest fool in the world on June the twelfth. But I predict he's going to get a three star match out of David. Yeah, I'm intrigued to see that match now. <laughs> After watching Arn and David. Well, you know, if he's uh, if David's not comfortable with the old man, he's never going to be comfortable with anybody. <laughs> well, if he doesn't, if he doesn't, then there is no hope. <laughs> You're right. David. You're right. I thought Arn's uh, interview on Thunder last week, the punchline, was well, you know. I may not be the enforcer anymore, but David, you're damn sure not your daddy. So. <laughs> <laughs> and Arn still cuts a hell of a promo, doesn't he? Oh, okay. yeah, yeah, he's he's tremendous. Yes, he yeah. sure sure is. I, you know, uh, I know we're backing up here. I, I thought uh, I would have to agree with you, and I, and I hate agreeing with you, David. Damn it! But uh, I thought the first two matches and the last two on the last WWF pay per view made the show. Oh yeah. Yeah, and and I thought it was. I just said to Jr. the other day, talked to him briefly, and I said, "You put wrestling back into wrestling. I think that's tremendous." I li I really like that backlash pay per view a lot. Oh yeah, I mean that yeah. was um that was a really you know that's like that's like really how many good pay per views? I mean the WCW pay per view was good, the ECW pay per view was good. I mean it's like we went through a period where like every, we were we were dreading every pay per view. Every pay per view was bad from every company. Now all of a sudden. I don't know what it is. Maybe it's the water or something. But, uh, <laughs> but I, you know, it's like it's like guys are motivated. You know, you can see. I think it's like pressure from from outside sources. But ever you can see that guys at all three companies are really motivated to. I think nobody wants to have a bad match right now. Whereas even a couple of months ago, it just seemed like a lot of guys were just like collecting paychecks right. and. You know, something's, something's motivated the guys. You're right. And Even Hogan has cranked it up a notch or two. Yeah, he has. Yes, and uh, that's scary. <laughs> that's frightening. Yeah. But that's, you know, I, I think, you know, if he can lead uh, at all, I mean, if he's going to be a leader at all, and, of course, I know there's a lot of, you know, he's not actually a leader in the locker room, but I would think with some of these guys, if they actually, if they pay attention and see that he's working harder, that should motivate them some, too, because I think that kind of tells you he's trying to hang on to his spot. Well, you know, you know, he, he knows. Like, I think the last, I think the last management that they had there, I think that there was a feeling that they didn't have the guts to make the changes. Right. And maybe Hogan thinks, you know, if if he, you know, I think I think hey, the company, hey, the comp, the company hit rock bottom. Let's face it. And I think that uh, Hogan wants to be perceived as the guy who helps rebuild it if he sees that there's light at the end of the tunnel. I don't know how. I don't know if he really, you know. He also saw Russo get rid of him the first time he was in. Yeah, but that was half his doing too. 
You know, I mean, he, you know, yeah, Russo got rid of him, but Hogan was playing a game. You know, Hogan, Hogan was sitting there thinking that Russo was going to fail, and he was just going to sit out there while the ratings plummeted without him, and then he would come back as the savior, which is kind of what happened, except when he came back as the savior, he didn't say nothing. Yeah. <laughs> and you he, know, the, the one thing I didn't understand last night was Russo and David with the robe at the top of the hour. Uh huh. I, I I couldn't see that he. I mean, I, obviously he felt he was going to hold the crowd, but that would have been my last call. I just well, I didn't see the strength in that, you know. Well, it had Rick. Yeah, well, yeah. that's true too. That's true too. But I, I just thought you know you could have used something a little stronger than than just uh, Russo with a robe on. Yeah. I, I mean, it's not like that's something new anyway. He's out there a lot, and I, I just yeah. you know just felt that 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 wasn't as strong as it should have been at that point in time. Did you ever bump into Jumbo Saruta? Uh, yes, I did. Yes, I did. Uh, he, uh, when he was over in the States, that's been, I'm trying to think, that must have been back in the 70s, Dave. Yeah. When he was a young, uh, probably just his first or second year in the business. Yeah. Yeah, they'd send yeah. him over. They, You know, they used to send a lot of guys over to Dory Funk Sr. in Amarillo and right, Eddie Graham in Florida to get him some seasoning. Right, right. So we, the guys, I worked with uh, uh, Fujiami. He was in, in the early 70s, uh, just as a young guy. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, okay. Um, what, now, what, what is the lineup for the uh, Pillman Show? You and, want the uh, entire lineup? Or, uh, or, 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 or just yeah, the big stars? No, give us the whole show. Okay. We got 16 matches. Oh, my God. Yes. Huh. First of all, we're starting at uh, the, the Photos with the Stars, which we do every year. Uh, starts at 4. That runs 4 to 6. And, uh, you know, the first year in 98 at the... Um, uh, middle school field house. We had, I think, six or seven stars, or seven stars posing for photographs. Depending on uh, transportation, this year we're going to have 16 to 18 posing wow. for Polaroids with the fans, and that runs for two hours. And beginning at 5:30, we're starting what we're calling basically the developmental independent uh, showcase, and uh, that'll run from 5:30 to approximately seven. And the matches on that card, uh, got, uh, rapid delivery Rory Fox and Logan Kane taking on Jeremy Lopez and Jet Jaguar. Uh, Rory is out of our school. Logan is Al Snow's half brother. Uh, Lopez and Jaguar were trained by Malenko. Uh, then we've got, uh, Rico Constantino against BJ Payne. They're both, uh, WWF developmental, uh, wrestlers out of Ohio Valley. And, uh, BJ Payne's managed by, uh, one of our guys here, uh, GQ Masters III, and then we've got uh, WCW Developmental uh, Chuck Palumbo against uh, Sean O'Hare. Then we've got Reckless Youth from WWF against Scotty Saber, who's out of Ohio Valley. Both are WWF Developmental. And then an HWA, uh, well, a combination. Um, our tag team champions, uh, Surfer Cody Hawk and uh, the taxi driver, Matt Anthony McMurphy, against uh, one of our guys, uh, Matt Stryker, with Helena Heavenly. And his partner is Flash Flanagan, who's out of Ohio Valley, and also a WWF Developmental wrestler. That should take us up to about this 7 o'clock hour where we do our normal uh, introduction of the VIPs, the family, the 10 bell count, and all that. Then about 7.35, we come back. Um, Shark Boy defends his HWA Cruiser title against uh, Jamie Son of the Young Dragons, and he'll be managed by Tony Marinero. And then we have the finals of the HWA Heavyweight Tournament. Thus far, Chip Fairway has made it into the finals, and we won't know this weekend who the uh, his opponent will be. Uh, the winner of that will receive the brand-new belt from uh, HWA Heavyweight Belt from JMAR, which will be presented by the former HWA Heavyweight Champion, D'Lo Brown. Then we have Cody Michaels against Terry Taylor. Then we have uh, Dr. Tom Pritchard, managed by Jim Cornette, against Dwight Lightning, Tim Horner, with Missy Hyatt. Then we have the Harris Twins against Vampiro and David Flair. Special referee for that is Cincinnati Reds outfielder Dimitri Young. Then we have Billy Kidman with Tory against Chris Candido with Tammy. Then we have D'Lo Brown against the Road Dog. Uh, D'Lo's uh, sp uh, special guest manager is uh, Cincinnati Reds closer Danny Graves. And Doggy's uh, special guest manager is uh, Reds first baseman Sean Casey. Then we've got the franchise, Shane Douglas versus we're not sure because, uh, as you know, Flair's uh, dad is in the hospital and it's day to day. So we're not sure if Rick's going to be able to make it or not. But Shane says he'll take on any WCW guy in the house. So if Rick doesn't show up, he'll be ready to do battle. Then we've got a uh, triple threat match. Um, Dean Malenko versus Perry Saturn versus Eddie Guerrero. 
Then we have the ECW World Title, just incredible with Francine against Raven. And to round it out, Chris Benoit with Woman and, of course, his new son, Daniel Christopher, uh, to take on Lord Stephen Regal. And uh, I think that should be textbook wrestling. <laughs> Wow, that's a lot of that's a lot of wrestling. I'm really interested, in listening, especially some of the. Um, I'm interested in looking at a lot of the undercard guys. Really, you yeah. Know, like, got a lot of the developmental guys from from both companies. Yeah, I, I, I think we got a good cross section. You know, the developmental, the independence of the stars. Oh, and by the way, uh, Nash, uh, Kevin Nash, and Dallas Page will be here as our special guest, along with uh, Ricky the Dragon Steamboat as well. Yeah. So, uh, and of course, we got the celebrity auction right now out on eBay. We have a Ric Flair robe, a pair of Chris Benoit, or excuse me, Chris Jericho boots, uh, one of Kimberly's Nitro Girl outfits. One of uh, Dallas Page sent us a, a white friend's leather jacket that he wore when he was uh, managing the Diamond Stud. Uh, Billy Kidman's bringing a pair of his uh, jean shorts autographed. Devo's bringing the white uh, satin pimp outfit from WrestleMania. <laughs> and so, uh, you know, it's just going to be another. Uh, and if you go to the JMAR uh, belt site, the we uh, we sent Joe Marshall, who makes the championship belt. You know, he always don- donates a belt for a raffle every year. And this year, usually it's, a, it's an old NW, a replica of an old NWA belt. And this year, he has taken the artwork for the Film in 2000 T-shirt and made that the main plate on the belt. So you talk about something that's going to be one of a kind. And we're going to have all the wrestlers uh, autograph the uh, leather part of that belt, and that will be raffled off. And then the friend of Ricky Steamboats uh, that did the uh, artwork for us last year is coming up with another rendering, which will also be part of that raffle. So, And, of course, Dave Meltzer is going to do his show live. We're doing the show live 6 to 8, so we'll... Uh... We'll be watching a lot of those. We'll be talking about those matches, uh, the, some of the under the undercard matches as they go on. Actually, yes. Actually, a lot of this will be going on during the show. Sure, right absolutely, absolutely. Wow, that's awesome. Yeah, I, th- I think we got some tremendous matches, and I I think uh, if the loose cannon were around, he would say, "Yep, that that's pretty good. We're going to see some some damn good wrestling on this show," and I think we will too. And I, well, Dave, you were here last year, don't you think uh, that the guys, since they're working in front of their peers, kind of crank it up a notch? Yeah, I thought I thought everyone I thought everyone did, especially um, Benoit and Rey Mysterio Jr. and those guys. I mean, they had a really a really good match. Oh yeah. Um, and, and I mean every every and, I mean every match was good. I mean I mean even like I tell you what you know like Terry Taylor and Tom Pritchard it was old school but it was like uh, I mean it was like boy you know it was like totally solid you know. Right. Yeah, I mean, you know, uh, some of my kids in that particular match, a couple of my students came to me the next day and said, you know, you're always talking about psychology and how the match flows. And it, he said, boy, I, everything you've said to me was very clear in the Pritchard-Taylor match. And I said, yes, I expect it was. But, you know, in a lot of these matches, you know, should, I mean, there's a lot of good, solid workers on this card. And, you know, what? You know, you, uh, to me, Rhodey is one of the – uh, most underestimated performers in our business because mm-hmm. although Brian doesn't have that great body or that great, you know, uh, uh, matinee idol look, he understands the psychology from his dad and his brothers, and he goes out there, I think, and elevates everybody he gets a chance to work with. You know, and Delo's mm-hmm. no slouch either as a performer. Yeah, well, they, they, had, they, they did real well. Was it was it was Delo or was it Al Snow with, uh, it was Al Snow with Road Dog last year? Yeah, it was Al with Road Dog last year, and yeah. Delo was with uh, Foley. Right, right. Yeah, but that's uh, yeah. I, I think all these. I, I think anybody that shows up for this show will get their their money's worth, no doubt about it. And I think also the other thing is is that for a lot of the uh, the guys, these underneath guys, um, it's probably it's 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 like a national audience for them to work in front of. I think that you know I noticed it with with your guys last year. You could see everybody was. Um, I mean, those guys were up. That was like you know the biggest show those guys were going to work on all year. Absolutely. Absolutely. Of course, Shark was able to get his developmental contract basically off the strength of that, too. And we've had independent kids sending us tapes and emails uh, six months ago, you know, uh, saying, I live in wherever, uh, Seattle, or, or, you know, I'll pay my own transportation, let me come and work on the show. And, you know, the sad thing is, David, I'd love to give all those kids, you know, a chance to showcase themselves. It's just, a, it's you know, somebody said, well, how are you going to top this one? I said, unless we can add three days to this thing, I don't see how we can even come close. And of course, what we have mentioned is on Wednesday before, we're doing the fantasy camp, the Mark Curtis uh, fantasy camp. So that's, the, that's the 20... 24th. 24th, and then the show that we're talking about is the 25th. 25th, wanna, right. Yeah, I just want to make sure everyone knows it's, um, I guess, what's that, a week from Thursday? Uh, yeah, week uh, 
Yeah, the fantasy camp's a week from tomorrow, and then a uh, week from Thursday is uh, the Pillman. Yes. Yeah. Uh, fantasy camp, if you don't mind me throwing a little plug in here, we still have some uh, spots open. It's 550 bucks for the day. We start at 11 a.m. We'll probably finish somewhere around 8. We're going to serve lunch and a hot buffet at the end of the day. Um uh, you know, you get a T-shirt, a group picture. You get to cut a promo with your favorite wrestler or the wrestler of your pick. We hand you the video right there on the spot. And, of course, we're going to try to simulate uh, at the first day in camp, you know, and put these people through some paces and have a good time while we're at it. And at the uh, camp, we're going to have Benoit, D'Lo, Shane Douglas, Eddie Guerrero, Road Dog, Billy Kidman, Malenko, Cody Michaels, uh, Tommy Pritchard, Perry Saturn, Shark Boys, Al Snow, Terry Taylor, myself. Tory Wilson's going to be there if you just want to stand around and stare. And uh, David Pinzer's going to be in for both days. And uh, when we serve dinner that evening on Wednesday, uh, David's going to conduct a Q&A session. So uh, we're having two of our rings set up in the ballroom of the Quality Inn just uh, around the corner from our gym. And I think that's going to be uh, a fun thing, too. And, of course, Pam Hildebrand will be in for both days. And uh, we're also uh, going to have uh, Mark's referee jersey at ringside for the Pillman Show. As you know, he was an intricate part of that show both years. So, Oh, yeah. Yeah. Good. So I, I just think all in all, and I don't know, you, you've heard the rumors about Arquette, right? Uh, what about David Arquette? No. That he was going to donate money to wrestlers. Yeah, 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 I did hear that. Well, yeah, 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 he's going to. <laughs> okay. Yeah, we, uh, we've been, he actually, I, I'm proud to say he contacted us, and um, he has a deal coming up, and I'm not sure in terms of the amount. Uh, but he wants us to be uh, the do the disbursement, and he plans on uh, – he's got a series of events that he's doing with the WCW, and uh, whatever the contractual agreement is on that, he will uh, send to us, and he wants us to distribute it between the Pillman Foundation, the Mark Curtis, and Drawsdor's family. Wow. Yeah. That's really, so I, that's I, really I, nice of him. Yes. I said uh, I would – he is certainly a champion human being, if not a champion wrestler, and I'll be the first to give him a belt for that. So I've invited him. He's uh, prepping for a movie up in Vancouver currently. I talked to him on Saturday, and uh, just a real nice guy. I was very impressed, you know, by his demeanor. And um, I invited him to come to the film, and I thought, you know, because Melanie, obviously, and Pam, will, uh, two of the three recipients will be there, and he's going to see if he can make arrangements. So our cat may be in the house as well. So I think we have a great day. Wow, that's really impressive. That's really impressive. Before we get to the calls, I wanted to ask you one question. There was a guy, you had, uh, when, when you were on ABC 2020 a couple months back, right. um, there was a guy that you had, one of your students, who was a muscular football player guy. Right. Is he still around? Yes, he is. You, Ray Steele. Right. He, he is real, in the, real uh, high on him. Uh, he is in the finals uh, of the heavyweight tournament. In fact, he and a uh, guy named Alexis Machine, uh, who's one of our guys, uh, are wrestling to see who takes on fairway uh they're wrestling friday night at a carlisle ohio so it'll either be alexis machine or ray Steele against uh chip on the 25th for the hwa heavyweight belt yeah he's uh he's looking good david he is 255 with abs it's about six foot one and clean wow yes and a friend well you know uh john perillo's here in town and uh, Perillo Performance Products, yep. and a friend of mine has a real great hardcore gym just north of us in a little community called Middletown, Ohio. And Ray's been training up there with my friend Mike, and uh, John met him, took a shine to him. So John's been helping me with nutrition. My friend Mike's been working with him in the gym. This kid, I think, uh, if for no other reason than just his focus and his, his fire and dedication to the business, he's got to go someplace. Uh, I think you'll be impressed. Last year, he was just a student here and was part of the security force and helped around the uh, you know around the film and show. And uh, I think if you see him perform this year, you'll be quite impressed, with, especially for the fact that he's actually just been out in front of the public uh, just a little over six months at this point in time. Wow. Yeah. Let's let's start with phone calls. Let's go to Brent in Seattle. Brent, how are you doing today? Yes, I'm uh, doing well, Dave. How about yourself? And uh, hey, Brian. Hey. Um, uh, Les, uh, first I I uh, think this show is just outstanding. Uh, it's great how you're able to get uh, both WCW and the WWF to uh, you know to cooperate on a uh, on an adventure. It'd be nice to think of David. I'm not able to hear him. Oh yeah. Oh, he's just he, he speak up, but also he's just saying how how you know how great it is that you're get you've been able to get WWF and WCW to uh, you know cooperate. I mean, you know, you see the WCW and WWF developmental guys on the same show. That's pretty impressive. You know, aside from the big stars. You know, uh, let me say right here that uh, 
both those companies and Paul Heyman and ECW have been tremendous. You know, Heyman moved the show this year to get out of our way. Right. Unsolicited. Yeah, he was in Columbus, just 100 miles north of us, on that Thursday night, the 25th, and uh, we didn't prompt it or even ask or even suggest that he not have canceled that show. And he has Stephen DeAngelis call me and said, tell Les that uh, we're moving the show to Saturday in Columbus. And uh, but he was prepared even even when they were still thinking about running the show. We're going to send us this match down. We're going to put him on first in Columbus and then shoot him right down to us. So, in fact, uh, he had his, the local promo we cut, 30-second to run on the uh, cable stations here in the area. He uh, told Stephen to call me and have me ship one off to him, and if he got it in time, it's going to pop up on TNN this next Friday night. So uh, I, was, I was teasing Stephen. I said, this is bad. I said, Paul Heyman's bad reputation is going to get washed clean. <laughs> we can't have this. But, he, yeah, they, they've all been tremendous. And... Um, you know, uh, Jim Ross uh, with Vince and Terry Taylor and J.J. down in Atlanta. And uh, we couldn't have done it, obviously, without them. And they've all been tremendously cooperative. And, of course, the real big deal is the guys that are coming in here for not one day this year, but a lot of them for two days, they're valuable days off, and they're giving it up. And, of course, these guys are performing for nothing. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that is, is just a... Uh... Sounds like a spectacular show, and I got a lot of respect uh, for Paul Heyman. Uh, Dave and Brian, I had a question for uh, for you guys. What exactly is Eric Bischoff uh, doing right now? Because if he's not allowed to touch the checkbook and and uh, Vince Russo is taking care of booking, what is he doing? Uh, staying out of everybody's way and trying to probably, probably trying to cut deal, you know, deals and things like that. <laughs> what kind you know, of deal? to expand the company name and things, you know. I think there is actually a deal they're working on for uh, Wednesday. Not just storyline. Uh, as far as? As far as the deal they did at the end of the show where they said they weren't going to be at Thunder or whatever. Yeah, yeah I heard Russo's going to actually be at Thunder, but he's not going to perform. Yeah. Uh, which is part of the storyline. But Eric, yeah, Eric's working on something, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So Are they gave it real secret of exactly what that is? I don't know what it is. Somebody told me he's a WWF guy, but I don't They're know. They're saying it's huge. <laughs> and... Yeah, oh, big, WF, big WF thing. But but Russo's uh, going to wrestle? No, 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 no. Oh, okay. I no, Russo's going to be at the, Russo's going to be there, but he's not going to Russo's not going to perform there. But but he will be there, you know, putting you know putting the show together. But Bischoff, I was told, it was not even at TV tonight. Oh, he's work, working on whatever big deal he's working on. I see. He's back doing big deals again. Then. Yeah, he's trying to get people to breach to to uh, find the loopholes in the contract. Well, he did a good job with that. He got a lot of big stars in there the first time. <laughs> My favorite was when he took Mike Oz, who was not a, or got him from his contract or whatever. And then, like, in that same span of however many weeks or whatever, put the Cruiserweight and Hardcore title on two guys not under contract. <laughs> now, how uh, when does that? CBS announce their, uh, their fall lineup? And will that, um, you know, will they be announcing the, the uh, WWF part of the fall lineup? Um, I guess NBC all... just announced yesterday. Everything, is, from what I gather, everything is on hold waiting for the courts or to settle out of court, one or the other. Um, I think there's some settlement meetings. And if they would go through, I guess the idea is that, that USA would get paid money to relinquish its claim to right of first refusal, and that, uh, you know, the wrestling wouldn't go on CBS except as specials, but it would go on, uh, you know, it would stay on the UPN, and then uh, it would go on uh, the Raw, you know, all the, all the Raw and the, um, the Raw, the Superstars, and the Challenge, or not the Challenge, the Livewire would go to uh, TNN, and then MTV would have Sunday Night Heat on Sunday night, so that's how it would that's how it would go this season, and then the season after. Um, I don't know what's going to happen to SmackDown at that point. And then the two syndicated programs could continue to be syndicated? Right, right. Okay. Uh, okay. And, and CBS can go ahead and announce their fall lineup, and regardless of how the court case turns out, they wouldn't have to change anything. Right, because CBS, whatever they're going to do with wrestling is only going to be special programming anyway. Like they may do like you know the old Saturday Night Main Event type thing once every two months or something before a pay per view or something before a major pay per view do a big special. But they're not going to do weekly shows at least this season. The season after, you know, who knows? Got it. Thanks a lot. I want to mention real quick because we have not brought this up, but it is official that Landstorm has signed a three-year contract with World Championship Wrestling. I think that uh, it's pretty evident watching the pay-per-view, and uh, he did release it on his website. Um, I think he's going to be starting in a couple of weeks. I don't think he's going to be on this Monday, although maybe. But uh, within probably two, three weeks, I'm sure he'll be on Nitro, and uh, who knows? <laughs> Let me ask you a question, David. Sure. Uh, you, uh, the last car was talking about the TNN and WWF and so forth. Uh, 
I realize that WWF can elevate TNN to some degree. I don't see that TNN can do a thing for WWF, but I'm not sure that even the combination is puts WWF in the same position they're in on USA. I, I don't see the value. I don't think it's as strong. I think that they're, you know, I mean, obviously they're going to, they're going to get a lot of money, and they're going to be connected with the CBS organization. They'll have a lot more tie-ins as far as, you know, billboards, radio advertising. Right. Since, you know, I mean, that's what they're looking for. As far as come the fall, will their ratings go up? You know, based on this, I would say they would probably go slightly down. Right. I mean, you know, I mean, I, I don't know if it... You know, I mean, I mean, people don't. You know, USA Network regular viewers, I don't think watch WWF. But, but you know, whenever you're on a stronger station, your ratings are going to be higher. It's just natural. And Absolutely. Absolutely. So yeah, I think I think their ratings will go down a little bit on TNN, and and they're just hoping that everything else will make up for it. And uh, you know, I mean, whatever it is. I do see that if ECW goes to USA, that's a major jump for Paul. What well, if EC? Okay, the thing is. It is. It's huge. It's huge, but then it's it's it the negative is thing. the negative is if, if they throw him on Monday night for two hours against those other two shows, um, he may come out looking real bad too. Right. Well, yeah, I, I would think that yeah, if if this was a fly, ECW and USA, USA is going to have to pump some money in there to up the production values, and Paul's going to have to change his style of booking, obviously. Yeah, I mean it's going to be real tough. But the thing with it with the, with uh. With the ECW is is that um, they've been fortunate for themselves to stay out of that direct comparison where on Monday night, you know, we see like WCW getting its ass kicked, so to speak, every Monday night as far as the ratings aspect of this goes. And ECW can go in there on Friday and their ratings are, you know, in comparison to their companies, they're not good, but there's always the excuse of it's Friday, it's TNN. I mean, they've got a lot of what I would call crutches on that. Right. They go to USA on Monday. I mean, there's no crutch. It's Monday night. It's wrestling night. They're going in there against those two sh shows that are both going to be on weaker networks. And, you know, they, um, I would presume, would have the third highest rated show on those networks. I mean, they'd probably do better than they do on CNN. Right. But yeah. maybe not, just because the fact that uh, you know, they'll probably still do better than they did on CNN. But I mean, it's just like being there Monday for two hours that's a lot. That's a lot for that roster because that roster doesn't have a lot of depth. You're right. There's no depth to it. You're right. You're right. Yeah. yeah but, of course, again, if, if USA pumps some money in, that gives him a chance to go out there and uh, get in the hunt for some talent, too, when the contract time comes up. He always gonna ha he's going to have to. Right. Uh, be because, I mean, I, I was like watching that, that like the pay-per-view they had. And like just as an example, you know, they had Dave Cash and C.W. Anderson who went out there and had a really good match. But you put that match on Monday night against... You know, like anyone on WWF, and I mean, you know, CW, just people aren't going to look at him as a star. And then you're also on Monday night, the look of the show, they're going to see this great-looking Raw, this not-as-great-looking Nitro, but it looks pretty great compared to the, the ECW look. And the look is just, you know, the look and the pyro and all that to the casual fan when they're comparing, you know, that's what makes stars is the, is the look of the show. It's like, I, you know, one of the things that I've always think that, like, the, the, the promoters of... of of boxing and other sports like that miss in the success of K1 in Japan and WWF in the United States both is, you know, inherently, unless you've been around wrestling forever and, and no, like, like a, a lot of guys in different environments, you can take the same guys and put them in different environments and in some places when everyone looks like a star and the production is great, these guys like a Bob Holly can get over as a star where in another situation, Bob Holly would get over as, as nothing because of the environment. Oh, you're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. And that's, uh, that's one of the things, of course, Vince is, is obviously good at, is how to showcase uh, average talent to make it look above average. You know, that's, I, I think that's the great thing that he does. Oh, I'm good with that, too, though. In a different way. Yeah. For, for wrestling fans, because he knows how to develop... He know, actually, what Paul Heyman's good at, and this is, is something that, that even I would say he's much better than Vince at, is Vince is good at, at showcasing talent. Paul Heyman is good at hiding weaknesses and accentuating strengths of talent in the ring. Yes, and that's never been more apparent than when guys leave there, yeah. and, and they aren't protected. And you see, my God, he wasn't—he was a lot better than that on ECW. 
Yeah, you know, but because Paul, 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 like, I mean, just as a perfect example with, with Awesome, you know, I would talk to Paul about certain matchups with Awesome, and he would just go, no, can't do it, it'll expose Awesome. Right. You know, and in WCW, they throw Awesome out there with Nash, who's, you know, not a particularly good worker, and, you know, all of a sudden, you know, you know, Mike Awesome certainly doesn't look the same as he did in ECW, and there's a reason, because Paul protected him with Tanaka, and, and, and guys like Spike Dudley and Kid Cash would take big bumps for him. Sure. He looks more. He looks more like an average person than when he's standing next to Nash or Sid or, or any. Well, or some of the guys who we wouldn't consider big in, as far as WCW, but he looks average with, with those guys. And the one thing they shouldn't allow him to do yet is interview. Yeah, and Paul Paul barely did. Yeah, uh, I, but I, you know, there's the thing that I don't understand about both companies yet. Uh, this has become uh, more of an interview-driven uh, industry. Uh, it's so, you know, the little skits, the little uh, vignettes are so important. Then with all the money that's being spent to, to produce these shows, why wouldn't we get a diction coach or an acting coach or someone? Coach. Yeah. Or even use someone like Arn. Yeah, there, there are Lord, yes. We say it all the time. Why is an, why, why is an Arn Anderson coaching or Terry Funk? Exactly. I mean, they brought Terry Funk back. I mean, before they ever brought him back, I would always go, you know, you guys should bring in Terry Funk and have him coach. This is when Benoit and those guys were there. Coach Chris Benoit, be his tutor on interviews because, you know, Chris Benoit can learn. He just needs the hands-on, you know, yes. training. And say they bring Terry Funk in to wrestle, you know. And, yes. And they've got Arn, they got Arn there who's just an incredible interview. And, and, and I think both sides should do it, you know. Um, I mean, I think that, that Vince should hire an interview coach for Benoit. And have him study it because, my God, when, when that guy can interview, his ring work's the best in the world. You're absolutely right. Yes, I, I agree. Yeah, Arn, Arn should be put to better use. And Terry uh, should be a part of somebody's booking committee, Terry Funk. I mean, he's just got a tremendous uh, agile mind for this business. And, of course, I realize he doesn't play politics well, and he'll be the first to say that himself. So maybe that's part of it. But, yeah, I think when you got somebody like that, him and Arn there, and, and along with Rick, I mean, my God, if these young guys in that company couldn't learn from these three, they couldn't learn at all. Yeah. You know, and I would I would try to use them in some utilize them in some way, you know, to, to elevate my younger talent. Like Billy, uh, tremendous worker, Billy Kidman. I mean, I, and a great kid. I mean, he's a really nice kid. Uh, but he can't do a heel interview, because, well, in part because his voice is higher. But it just doesn't, you know, coming from that physique and, and that face, him trying to be a bad guy just doesn't work. I, I just think he's so miscast. Yeah. I mean, I think he's, you know, Billy Kidman is so begging to be an underdog baby face. Right. And, you know, just for, for and, and he's just so miscast, especially because you know, he just seemed to good, good heel promos. Yeah, and, you know, and then watching the thing with him and Hogan, okay, so Terry's selling for him a little bit. Okay, given, but still the size difference, and a little bit. <laughs> yeah, and and Hogan can't even get close to to working uh, Billy style, and Billy certainly is not a, a guy who does power stuff. You know, he's he's can't get out there and just power bomb somebody and, and make it believable. Uh, that's just a bad matchup, any way, shape, or form. And I, I think, to me, uh, the um, automatic thing that I saw when Candido came on the scene was Billy and Tori and uh, Chris and Tammy. That's, that's why I put it on the film. And I just, you know, it made sense to me. I had a kid, a kid call our radio show the other night and said, uh, do you realize that the semifinal in the WWF, uh, pay, this last pay-per-view, was your main event three years ago on film? And I said, yeah. He said, do you think you're smarter than they are? I said, no, don't say that. <laughs> I, I don't think I'm smarter than anybody. But, I mean, it's just, you know, when I book that show, I, I book it in part, I guess, to please myself while I lie about it, but in part what I think Brian Pillman would book because he was about good, solid work, you know. And that to me, Candido and Kidman go out there and tear the building down, given the opportunity. Let's go to West in Virginia. West, you're next up with uh, Les Thatcher. Hey, guys, how's it going tonight? All right, how about you? Pretty good. Uh, Les, I wanted to ask you and if you have any update with your relationship with WCW and if there's any new prospects uh, that you got sent in there or that they've got sent in to you. Uh, you know, uh, we're just getting that underway. We're just getting the ball rolling on that. And uh, next week will be the first, at the film, will be the first chance that Terry's, uh, Terry Taylor's had a chance to look at my guys and that uh, I'm going to start, they're going to start feeding me guys actually the first part of June. 
and so I haven't really had a chance to to work with any of their guys extensively. I've been I was I, I was enjoying watching this the Saturday night show when they were showcasing the the power plant kids because it gave me an opportunity to you know to look at them and critique them. Uh, but I'm really looking forward to it. I, I think it's going to be a good relationship and. Uh, you know, it, it's for us. It's an opportunity to prove that we can do something, and uh, I think with those kids down there, it's just a matter of getting them out in front of crowds, and then uh, you know, trying to uh, work the uh, work the uh, uh, weak points out of their offense and defense uh, once you see them out there. I, I think they've got some tremendous athletes, and I think I've got a few that might be of value to them. You know, it's just a matter of uh, getting everybody together. It's. Uh, you know, there's, I think right now there's a lot of good development on town. I think WWF's got some. Uh, Cornette and Danny Davis have got some good kids down there. I, I think that, uh, you know, it, it bodes it. Two years ago, I would have said, my God, I don't know what's going to happen to our industry in 10 years, but I wouldn't say that today because I see some good kids, and thank God there's some good people working with them. That's the main thing. Also, uh, well, picking up on that note, uh, the way that they've handled this situation in New Japan with the uh, tournament, uh, I just can't believe that they, you know, they couldn't have picked, you know, better people to send over than, you know, Funk and Skipper. I mean, I saw them on Saturday night, and, and they've got talent, but I just don't think they're ready for that kind of platform. I was wondering what your thoughts were. I would agree with that. You know, uh, now I know a couple guys in WCW are real high on, on Skipper, and, uh, you know, somebody was telling me that this kid is a tremendous dancer. My question is, why is he dancing it? I mean, seriously, you know, that, that when I was told to me, uh, my old feverish mind started to work, and I could see, you know, I'm thinking about music and, and how to get into the ring with it. I mean, you, have to, you know, it's showbiz to a, you know, a big degree anymore, and, you, and you've got to play to the, somebody's strength. Um, well, you know, it's kind of like Pal- Palumbo. Is he an impressive-looking athlete? Certainly. But I think he needs to be protected currently like they protected Goldberg. You know, I mean, the more you leave him out there, the more obvious his you know, his weak points are showing. And uh, I think a brief, uh, you know, brief little a few minutes at a time is all he needs out there until he becomes more comfortable with the whole situation. And, I, was, uh, I, would, I, I mean, he was he wasn't ready to do an interview on prime time. No, absolutely. You know, not. I mean, that was the one thing when he went when it went out there, and I was really feeling sad for him because. You know, he went to Japan, and I thought that was a good place. You know, get those because because if they work in Japan under in the undercard, no one here will ever see them. So you you know, first first time you see him, you want to be able to impress him. And he's he's got a good look. I mean, I thought he had a good look when I saw him on some of the other shows before. But then as soon as he did the interview, you know, all of a sudden I just see like everyone going like, ah, you know, here's some guy they're trying to push on us rather than here's some guy who's good. Right. Exactly. No. And I, you know, and I, I realize that most people say, well, you know, the day of the squash matches are over just so, since studio wrestling, uh, you know, has become passe. But I would think in a situation like Palumbo, a squash match is the way to, you know, to keep him fresh and uh, not expose his weaknesses. You know, to give him, I mean, you don't have to, he obviously doesn't have to beat some established star, but uh, give him another power plant kit or something, but, and give him a clean win. Give him, know, I, I, uh, <laughs> Give him one of the Vianos. Give him one of the Vianos. Those guys are awesome. <laughs> when in doubt, give him a Viano. <laughs> give him Dandy. Dandy small so he can he make him look big. Sure. But he has no talent, yeah. <laughs> but, I felt sorry for is you have poor Chuck Palumbo in there, and he's supposed to be the next Lex Luger, and, I mean, the way he's been pushed and everything like that, he's not even measuring up to Lex Luger. <laughs> <laughs> well, you, you know, my, my biggest my biggest thought about WCW is, you know, I, I think we all uh, agree that, it, you know, it's been said, my God, printed and read and said and posted on websites that it's six months to a year before this company's going to be turned around. Anyway, regardless of what anybody wants in the, in the hierarchy above them in, in the corporate structure, that's what it's going to take. And I, and I think to slowly build these guys and quit, you know, and quit trying to rush them, uh, the rushing is a mistake, I think, with Palumbo. Let him get some good sound foundation. If you've got to put him out there on a major TV show, get him a quick win and, you know, so, so the fans can't pick his, uh, his weaknesses apart. And I think, you know, again, some good, solid, clean finishes on that TV right now would be very appropriate. Brian, Brian, I got to read this to you. This is from Snoopy, and uh, they're filling filling in the gaps anyway. Uh, Chronic stole the tag team belts back from Bagwell and Douglas last week on Sunday Night Heat, so that's why we didn't see oh, it. Oh, yes. Uh, okay. Some, some, some. We're gonna get we're gonna get an email like going like, wait a minute, that doesn't make sense. <laughs> If it did, we wouldn't be talking about it, right? Yeah. So anyway, I just wanted to just wanted to bring that one up. Um, and, 
Anything else, Wes? Yeah, one last quick thing. Uh, there's a vignette that I've seen on several WWF shows with these like little girls jumping rope that says Judgment Day is coming. You heard anything about that? Well, that's mean? that's that's just a preview for the. That's just a, the piece that the people in the creative department oh, okay. uh, put together for their the next pay per view. Oh, okay, thanks for the comments, guys. Okay, guys, it's time for our WWF Daily Trivia brought to you by RC Edge. The first two people to respond correctly by email to Dave Meltzer at iata.com will win a poster of a WF superstar courtesy of RC Edge. And remember to include your mailing address with your answer. Here's today's question, and this is one that I know is going to be answered within like five minutes by at least two people. Who was the first wrestler in the modern era? When I say modern era, let's say. 1965 to the present, who was allowed to wrestle in Madison Square Garden wearing a mask. For a while there, they weren't allowed, you know, they were not allowed to wrestle with a mask in Madison Square Garden. I remember when I was a very young kid where uh, the masked wrestlers would have these, uh, like the spoiler Don Jardine, for example, would, uh, would, would be a masked man in the circuit, but in Madison Square Garden he would actually not, he would, he could wear a mask around like his ear. Do you ever hear about this, Brian, with the way they used to do the masked wrestlers in the garden before, before the, the law changed? No. They would wear a mask, but their whole face would be exposed. So, like, they'd have a mask around their ears and the back of their head, but you could see their face. It's kind of, kind of weird. This was a long they, time before they let girls wrestle there, too. Yeah, because Moolah and them came in. That was in the mid, that was in the 70s, wasn't it? Yeah, exactly. Before, yeah, before they had the, the women. first women's match ever in Madison Square Garden. Yeah, that's right. In fact, I remember they had a tag team called the Russians that were actually two, um, 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 I think Cubans actually. Juan Sebastian and Pedro Godoy wrestled as the Mad Russians, but under masks. Yeah, Juan and Sebastian going to... and Pedro Godoy. You're right. Yeah, and they wrestled at the Garden as the mask or as the, as the Mad Russians, and everyone could see they were Hispanic. <laughs> well, you might, you, Pedro, you you might have misconstrued as a Russian, but never Juan. He he looked as Spanish. You could have typecast him as uh, Cesar Romero for God's sake. <laughs> Anyway, let's see. Let me, let me, let's run through a couple of emails here. Uh, we've got some stuff for less, so I'll get to that first. Um, this is our question. Every time you're on the show, what's up with Rory Fox? What's up with Rory Fox? Well, he's yeah. going to be on the Pillman show. He's putting on a little size. He's getting some experience, and he's, doing, he's coming along real well. Coming along real well. He's uh, he's developing fine, and uh, I, think he's going to, I think, you know, there's a contract, I think, in his future there someplace. He's uh, got a good look and a good attitude. He's uh, He's doing real well. Um, did you get a lot of feedback? I guess they must have, um, I don't know, within the last two weeks we played that MTV thing because we got a bunch of emails. Um, I'm, I'm thinking like about a week ago from people who, you know, seen that MTV. So did you get a lot of feedback from that the second time? Oh, yeah. Yeah, you know, it's amazing. I, I don't even have to see it, and I know it's played. Uh, the phones start to ring, and we start to get emails, people requesting brochures on the scam, on the camp and uh, all that. It's it, You know, I heard from the Banks Tarver, who produced that um, oh, just a few weeks ago. He was con talking about possibly doing uh, a follow-up, uh, which they do, I guess, on some of their features. But he was also telling me that he had taken that 90-minute uh, feature down to a, um, a film festival in North Carolina and got very, very good reviews on it. It was, good, it, was, it was a good deal. Yeah, you know, they obviously the the numbers on MTV must be good because they've been running that thing, Lord knows, off and on since August of last year. Yeah. You know, and it was last week or the week before they ran it, I think, three or four times. So, yeah, that's, uh, yeah, we always, we always uh, seem to, you know, the phone seems to ring a little more when, when MTV pops that thing in. Did you see the uh, Men's Journal feature of the May issue? No, I have not seen that. Yeah, we're featured in the, I guess it's on the newsstands currently, the May issue of Men's Journal. They sent a writer in uh, to uh, stay with us for a week. Uh, actually, a novelist out of Florida. It was the first uh, feature article I think he'd done for this uh, magazine. But it's, it's, yeah, I thought it's entertaining. And uh, he shows a lot of respect for the business. He was a very nice guy. And it's a good article. Pick it up and take, uh, get a chance to read it. Uh, also, is there going to be a tape of this uh, of the Pillman show available? A video. We're hoping so. You know how the politics are of yeah. getting releases and uh, all that sort of thing. You know, one of the fans emailed us uh, a few weeks ago with a very bright idea that I'm surprised none of us came up with. Uh, but uh, he was saying that you know what you should do is do the best of Pillman over the last three years, just using the independent matches. And you know, making a tape of those, and which is something we, you know, we're, we're, we've taped all three, uh, all three years. It's just a matter of getting releases and uh, getting everything put together. But I think what we're going to end up doing, I think, because it's a little late to try to get 98 out there and uh, 99. I think we're going to try to do a best of, 
and uh, you know, see if we can get all the companies to to finally cough up a release saying yes, go ahead and sell this thing. We're we're hoping to. I know uh, Smokey Genta, you know, uh, Dallas's friend. Uh, is, yeah, is, wrote the book. Yeah, That's exactly. He said, uh, I guess the next step's pay per view. I said, well, Smoke, if you send me 300000 to build a base on it, sure it is. <laughs> you know? But until that time, <laughs> that's a pipe dream. But, you know, we're talking about the, uh, the great cooperation from all these companies. But if you were to try to do a pay-per-view. Uh, no, but, then, but then you couldn't get cooperation. They'd all start cutting your throat. Sure. You know, you know? My, you know I thought, of, you know, when he mentioned that, though, and I thought, well, how would you, how would you go about that? And I thought, well, I, I guess if that were ever even remotely close to being a reality, I mean, if some angel came out of the sky and said, here's 300000 if you'll actually do a Pillman paper for you. Uh, but I guess I would approach um, the three companies and say, look, uh, you guys each pick a strong match uh, to give us for the top three matches that will help, you know, escalate your own storylines or, uh, you know, uh, to your next pay-per-views, and then this let me book the card below that. I, I just think, I think that then you're, I don't know, at that point I think that's when you start running into real problems. Oh, yeah, I would agree. Well, it's like now everybody says, well, which, which matches? The, I said they're all main events. Yeah. You know, and of course everybody can't be on top, and and uh, in part to keep anyone from feeling getting you know, feelings hurt, we've kind of done this thing. You know, Chris Benoit, you know, it was tight with Brian, and um, he's been uh, tremendous in helping me. You know, line up guys that I that I didn't really know or had just you know knew remotely, and uh, he's he's been so much help that I you know I feel and he's kind of the what what am I trying to say here? Uh, I, I guess. He would represent Brian Pillman in terms of his fire and uh, heart as far as his business is concerned. And so I've tried to, you know, to make Chris. That, that's why when we, at first we started, we were going to have the Radicals. We were going to have Benoit Malenko against uh, uh, Guerrero and Saturn. And uh, then we had uh, Al Snow was unable. He's coming in for the fantasy camp, but because of uh, some things come up with the family, he won't be able to be here for Thursday. I was going to have him with Stephen Regal, simply to give Al a, a showcase. I, I'm always teasing Al. I said, you know, the fact that you're a good technical wrestler is the best kept secret in the industry. You know, between you and the heads and trying to make Blackman a personality, you never get a chance to really wrestle. I'm going to put you with Regal. And Al was actually looking forward to it, and then he couldn't do that. And I'm trying to think, okay, now, who do I get to work with, Steve? And, and bless his heart, uh, Dan Wall came forward, and he said, well, you know, we you know, we both work in European style, Japanese style, and, of course, catch as catch can American style. He said, and I, I you know, love working with a guy named Regal would express the same uh, opinion several months ago to me. And so uh, the other three guys said, well, you know, we'll do a three-way, and everybody just, you know, so uh, we kept, we're kept we keeping Benoit on top as long as we can do that. And uh, I, he hasn't disappointed us yet. So, you know, and again, I think that's going to be, you know, if there's any aspiring young wrestlers and you're going to be at the Pillman, don't move from your seat when Regal and Benoit hit the ring because you'll probably see a few moves you've never seen before. I want to make real quick comment. Al, uh, who won the trivia question? We got two winners already. Okay, and the correct answer to the first uh, wrestler who was allowed to wear a mask in the modern era in Madison Square Garden was Mil Moscaris, who, in fact, uh, uh, as I recall, the way that thing went, that was that would be around '74, I'm guessing, that uh, you know he went and appeared before the New York State Athletic Commission, which actually had the rule in effect that you couldn't wear a mask in Madison Square Garden, and basically it was you know. If I can't wear a mask, you know, I'm not wrestling there. <laughs> you know what I mean? I mean, there was, it wasn't like Don Jardine and the rest of those guys who all, you know, they went there and, uh, you know, w went without the mask. I mean, Mil Moskris just told him, he goes, you know, if there's no mask, then I will not go there. And I guess, you know, he was a big money player back in those days. And whatever happened to cause the commission to change its mind, they did. And he headlined a lot of those shows there. I don't know that he ever did wrestle without his mask, has he? I don't think ever. I don't, he I don't either. Uh, because he because he started as Mil Moskers because the actual you know he, he there was actually a comic book character called Mil Moskers and he they hired a bodybuilder who was Aaron Rodriguez to play the role of Mil Moskers in pro wrestling it wasn't like he was a wrestler who came upon a gimmick the gimmick was actually made and then they looked for a, 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 a bodybuilder because the character in the comic book was a bodybuilder so uh, Mil Moskers was or Aaron Rodriguez was the Mister Mexico. And I guess he had done judo and everything, so he was a good athlete. And then they trained him in pro wrestling to be Mel Mosker. So I'm sure that he never wrestled without a mask. Yeah, I wouldn't think so. Is he still working, David? Oh, yeah. He'll be yeah. working until we're all dead. <laughs> How old would he be now? 
uh, 62 this summer. Wow. So 60, uh, he's having his uh, farewell tour of Japan, but he's really mad because they're building this farewell tour, but he wants to keep coming back. <laughs> and and um, he's still not selling, and he still never does jobs. <laughs> and, every, and I would think it, in his 60s it's time to do a job or two, isn't it? Yeah. You know, you know of all, I think of all the legends in wrestling, I mean, it's like kind of in Mick Foley's book a little bit, but of all the legends in wrestling, there's probably not one that I've heard of where he's it's like it's like personally I know people like him but business wise it's like everyone I mean just like the books like Mick Foley's book Billy right. Graham's working on a book and Billy Graham you know Billy Graham is just like you know you should see the stuff he wrote about Mill Moskowitz about trying to work with Mill Moskowitz because Mill Moskowitz would you know here's Billy Graham who was a you know marginal worker giving him a lot of benefit of the doubt, but you know, a strong personality, obviously. Sure. And Billy Graham was like, you know, Mill Moskowitz wouldn't sell for him. I mean, how, how do you wrestle a match where the babyface doesn't sell? And um, as if you look at the Madison Square Garden record books, you know, in the old days, the, the way they did their title, and one of the reasons their title was so strong is the champion always won the finishing match of the series. Like, uh, you know, this was when Bruno was champion and uh, Backlund and Morales and all of them. Right. I mean, they might do a DQ and they might do a stopped on blood, but the the, the final match was a 1-2-3 or a cage match win, but it was a clean win for the champion. And Moskowitz, when Moskowitz drew two sellouts with Billy Graham, and when it came time for the clean one, uh, I think Billy worked with Peter Mavia because Mill wouldn't do the job. Wow. And that's Madison Square Garden main event sellout crowd. <laughs> Good old Mill. Amazing. Amazing. Yeah, yeah he's. I, I know. I, I don't know him well. I've met him on a couple of different occasions. Uh, but most of the guys were very negative in terms of. I, I know I've, that I've talked to that have worked for the guy for the very reasons you're stating. You know, no sell, no no jobs, no nothing. I mean, I mean, for his day, I mean, he was an innovative performer. He was a great performer, yeah. but uh, but not to work with, I guess. <laughs> Just to watch. <laughs> yeah, there I you go. Uh, this is a question, Brian. Do you know, you may have an answer for this, and as some people listening may have an answer because I have no idea. And it just says, "Is there a credible site or source for internet information about Roller Jam?" So anyway, so a, a, a Roller Jam observer is actually what the guy's asking for, or something. I have no idea. I, I have no idea. Is that either. signed Cyrus from the network? <laughs> I got Cyrus's website. <laughs> You know, that's a great character, but I'm like you. That's a horrible name for an executive of a network, Cyrus. Well, thank God, like on CNN on Friday, they, his badge, the badge used to say Cyrus on it, and now, even though they call him Cyrus, the badge does say Don Callis. Does it? At least it doesn't yeah, say I, Mr. Virus. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I, I hated that name even before they gave him this gimmick. Um, this is, let's see, this is someone who's asking about Mako, who wrestled for main event. Who wrestles for main event? Uh, it goes, whatever became of the Goldberg clone Mako that wrestled for a main event out of Nashville? Oh, uh, you know, that kid, I, I don't know. He lives in Hawaii. I would love to get my hands on him for a long period. He and I spoke um, about the possibility of him coming up here. He lives in Hawaii, so I can't, I, you know, I can't blame him for not wanting to leave home for any length of time. Uh, Tremendous-looking bodybuilder, uh, David. Uh about six two, probably legitimately around two eighty, rock hard and uh, good kid, good attitude, uh, no experience and no talent, and apparently no one's tried to train him. He, he made a uh, European tour, which obviously anybody can do if you, you know, if you just look like a wrestler. Uh, Stephen Dunn and uh, Reno used him in there a couple times, but it was strictly. Talk about squashes, you know, it was the choke slam, choke slam, big splash or, or whatever, and you go home. Uh, but he is a good looking guy, and from the, the couple conversations we, we had, uh, I would think he has the attitude that if, you know, if someone were to take him, uh, and work with him, you know, he at least, he would at least give you his all to try. And if you can make any kind of work around him with a look he's got, uh, I think he would be damn good. Okay, let's go to Terry in North Carolina. Terry, you're next up. Hello, how you doing, Dave? No good. Okay, um, yes, I got a question. How you like last night's Nitro? Me? Mm-hmm. I, I, well, I mean, I, I thought it was uh, I thought it was probably the best one because of the flare stuff. The, the best one in, you know, a while. Uh, well, the first one that those guys did was a good show, too. But, um, yeah, I, the flare stuff was enough to where when the show was over, I thought it was a pretty darn good television show. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I kind of liked it pretty much also, too. But uh, the question I want to ask you, too, was this right here. About Mayhem, WCW Mayhem pay per view. Mayhem pay per view of... in November. Uh huh. 
What about it? That's too far away. Or do you mean the last one? I mean, because they had a lot of wrestling action in it involved also. Oh, because they did all those. They did a lot of matches that night. And, and um, I, as I recall, you know, so many pay per views back in November. I don't think I liked the show. Mm-hmm. Um, I thought that uh, if I think Benoit had some good matches with Jarrett. And, uh, Benoit and Jarrett had a really good match, and then they had. Um, it was Benoit and Jarrett, I think. Mayhem then, wasn't at the. Uh... It's Bret Hart and Benoit main event. Yeah, yeah, that was it. Yeah. And Sting wrestled Bret, right? That's a pretty good show. Just a lot of the matches were so short with horrible finishes. Yeah, but yeah, and, and, and I, I thought they really hurt the main event with all. The, they hurt the main event a lot with all the run-ins that they didn't need. Yeah, and that horrible match between Sivis and Goldberg, the I Quit match was horrible. Was that the one where we stopped on blood? Yeah. Nope. No, that, no, was that wasn't. I'm heavy. Okay, yeah, the stopped on blood one wasn't too bad. You're right. Yeah, okay. So this is the, the one that came back that wasn't good. Okay. <laughs> You know, this is not nothing to do with what you guys are talking about, but when you mentioned Goldberg and Brett in the same breath, I just I want to throw a little plug in here for the uh, film and auction. Uh, Dallas, uh, I guess it was left in the dressing room, and Dallas came up. Remember the breastplate that Brett wore when uh, Goldberg speared him? In mm-hmm. Toronto. Yeah. Okay. Well, we've got it for the auction. Dallas, oh. Dallas came up with it, and I guess he's a collector, too. <laughs> and, uh, you know. Uh, so, yeah, he sent it to us, and we've got that for the auction at Billman. That was that was um, a tremendous beginning of an angle that never went it. anywhere. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it was just like when they did that, it was like, wow, you know, Bret Hart and Bill Goldberg is a great angle because they're going to have good matches. It's going to make Bill Goldberg a better wrestler. And Bret Hart's reputation was enough that I think, you know, people would have bought it. And then somehow it just went nowhere. Yeah, I noticed Well, that. they both got hurt at the same I think it was going to go somewhere and they both got hurt is what happened. I mean, it's nobody's fault. They both got hurt. Mm, okay. Yes, and um, another show I thought it had less wrestling too was um, last year's WrestleMania. Uh, what the one a year ago? Yeah, with the Rock and um, Austin in the main event. I remember that being a pretty good show. You remember this that? Year's, this year's um, this year's wasn't as good. Yeah, I know that one. Not this year. I know that was weak, pretty yeah. much. But, yeah. um, the back, the back, the backlash was real good. By the way, um, you know, we we were talking about this uh, earlier, and I should bring this up because a couple of people emailed this in. Um, Rock did win, um, did win a match once in the WWF by submission, theoretically, because he used the sharpshooter on Mankind when they did the ring the bell, ring the bell finish on one of those pay per views, yeah, uh, where, right. where, where he won the title. Mm-hmm. God, like that same finish we've seen a million times. <laughs> I like how they brought up Bret Hart when he put on the sharpshooter last night, and I guess it was just. A hint for what the finish would be. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm expecting that um, pay per view that they're gonna be on coming up on um, this Sunday is gonna be pretty weak at main event. Well, it's either gonna. I tell you what. I mean, obviously the show's gonna be make, made, made or broken by that main event. And um, talking about the Iron Man now. The Iron Man, yeah. It's like yeah. Uh, they got a lot of pressure on them, and uh, you know, I hope they do it because you know it's it's a long time to not have a good match. You can tell me if you agree or not, but uh, I was being interviewed, and somebody asked me about that on set, and I said, you know, if they're going to go 60, Helms is going to have to carry it. I mean, he's obviously the more experienced worker, and I think his style lends more to getting 60 minutes in than Rock's does. Yeah. But I, I think that uh, if they start that brawling all over the building, uh, cardiovascular-wise, and just, they're not going to last 60. Plus, it'll, plus, if they start it off like that, it'll get redundant if they keep going. Yes, exactly. And I, now, here again, you know, I, and I think Dwayne Johnson is, is a tremendous performer, uh, great personality. I think he's still learning in terms of, you know, the technical skills in his work. Um, so I think Helms, he's got to carry a thing, and Roxanne has to let uh, Triple H call the match. You know, and so I had to pace it a little bit because that's the key to getting it in. I, th- I thought the uh, Hart uh, Michaels 60 was very good, but you know, in this day and age, obviously you can't just you can't sit down in a hammerlock for 15 minutes. But I think uh, you know, uh, Helms is going to have to pace the thing because I think Rock Rock's pace is, is too fast, and he's accustomed to the shorter, you know, maybe a 20 minute match. But we're talking 20 times three here. Uh, you know, it's going to have to be Helmsley's pace, or they're going to blow it out before they ever get there. We've got a ton of emails to get to. Um, let me just go through. Da, 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 da. You're going to talk about Lance Storm. What can WCW do with him? I see him working with Candido. If WCW starts wrestling again, if they don't do wrestling, what's the point of bringing him in? I think they just 
they felt they wanted to steal someone from ECW. Uh, I knew this was coming. Very first email we got, Brian, this quarter hour. Dave, Chronic couldn't have taken the belts back at Heat on Sunday. They worked for WCW. <laughs> I, I told you. I told you. I told you. Um, this is uh, from someone who says, um, I think you may have misunderstood Wes's question, but maybe he was just talking about the regular Judgment Day commercial, but there's a commercial aired during Raw that says his Judgment Day is coming. Who is he? If there's a he, it's the Undertaker. So the Undertaker is going to be there. That's, so maybe that's who he is. There's maybe nobody he, else in Judgment Day in WWF, could there be? Yeah, I don't know. I don't either, but it seems like he's due back, what, uh, next month? Uh, I think he's still be back in the ring, but I think he's gonna. I think he's gonna be there at the show. I think he's gonna. I think he's gonna be there in the last five minutes. Maybe um, when Vince goes to ring, his Judgment Day. Oh, I got it. I got the finish. We got the finish of the last pay per view too, which was really too bad because they didn't switch it. Actually, it was good because it was a good finish. Vince is going to ring the bell, and the Undertaker comes and stops him. It's Vince's Judgment Day. How's that? All right. Because Undertaker mm -hmm. comes in. Because I know Undertaker's coming in the last five minutes of that match. I don't know that. I'm just. Assuming that's the way they introduce people, you know what I mean, for impact. Right. So, I, so last minute Undertaker's coming out because, you know, well, Rock's about to get screwed. Yeah, I think that's the finish. Okay. Anyway, this is this is from Sean Kemp for you, Les, because this is actually an interesting question. He goes, I'm an asthmatic, and I would like to enter the business, and I'm very intrigued to know uh, if uh, anyone who suffers from this or what, you know, if that would be a drawback. Uh, you know, uh, the first guy that comes to mind, my God, and, and uh, he's, he's deceased is Jay York, the Alaskan, the original Alaskan. Mm -hmm. Jay was an asthmatic because I remember him coming back from the ring wheezing and getting the atomizer out of his bag. And, uh, you know, using, yeah, I've, I, there's been a few guys in the business that have been asthmatics. Um, and I would, you know, uh, not being a medical <laughs> person, uh, I would assume it, it's to what degree. You know, you have the asthma, but yes, I've known uh, several wrestlers that have uh, had asthma and performed uh, quite well. You know, I guess. Pac asthmatic. Beg pardon? Yeah, yeah, X Pac would be X Pac because X Pac was suffering from asthma a couple, um, just a couple weeks ago. So yeah, he would he would be. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah, Sean is, as a matter of fact. You're right. Yeah. 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 So yeah, that's 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 not an impossible hurdle to cross. Um, this is about Ric Flair. It says, uh, this is from Richard Sullivan, who says, Bob Ryder puts a photo of Ric Flair superimposed over a giant 15 on WCW.com. His other website proclaims that Ric Flair won the title for the 17th time, while WrestleLine declares that he's a 16-time champion. I still say, he, I still say he's a 20-time champion. This is Royal Duncan and Gary will agree, but come to their conclusion slightly differently than I do. Either way, Here's my obsessive compulsive rant on Ric Flair's house. I remember um, a year ago. I'm going to look up whatever number we came up with. I think it was 18. So that would make this 19. Anyway, um, I'm, rather than go through, maybe we don't have enough time on the show to go through the rant, the, the ones, but I'm going to go through and figure out because I remember Richard Sullivan wrote a thing and there were a couple that. Anyway, I, I came up with. I think I don't remember what number I came up with, but. Whatever the number is, 15 is not right, but 15 is the number they're going to use. So, so well, that's you know, uh, a lot of times back before uh, cable and you could see the same show all over the world, you know, that, that belt could have been changed in Japan and, and was never recorded as such. And, no, no, uh, no. You know, no, no, but we, 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 we know everything. Now. Right. Well, of course, <laughs> know all, then all. <laughs> no, when it comes to, you can't, you, they, they used to, um, they tried that once with Flair and Race in um, Singapore. And it was supposed to be a secret, but that one came out, and um, I don't know. Yeah, yeah you're Flair. the guy that stirred our business topsy turvy, Meltzer. <laughs> yeah, I think that speaks out all this. Stuff. Yeah, all of the stuff that actually, especially now that David Arquette held the title, I don't think it really matters how many times the guys you. held it. That's like somebody. But they'll uh, always count. An interviewer Saturday uh, was, you know, was talking to me. He said, uh, "What's your opinion of David Arquette as a WCW champion?" I said, "In a word, no." <laughs> <laughs> Why go past that, right? It's, uh, let's let's go to uh, Ricardo in New York. Ricardo, you're next up. Hi, hi, Dave. Hi, Mr. Thatcher. How you doing, Ricardo? I was just going to ask you about that <laughs> David Arquette question because. I've had a little argument with some of my friends that are um, WCW fans, and I tell them that the belt, WCW belt, has been really hurt by David Arquette winning it. But they try to make it as is the same thing as 
Vince McMahon winning it. Uh, how would you would you say it's different or is the same? I'll deal? tell you what. I'll tell you exactly why it's different, okay? Yeah. When Vince know. McMahon won the belt, SmackDown did a record rating. When David Arquette won the belt, Nitro did a record rating. But one was a record low and one was a record high. And that is the answer, okay? Yeah. Yeah, that... and, I mean, and believe me, Brian and I complained about Vince winning it. We complained about the way he didn't lose it back. If it was up to me, I wouldn't have done it because it was a hot shot for ratings. I don't think, you know, nevertheless... Ultimately, that's the that's the answer on what the difference is, um, and it, and it's it's not like it's right or wrong. It's just which judgment worked and which judgment didn't. And if the Arquette thing had built to a big rating, you know, I wouldn't have liked it, but I would have said, okay, it worked. <laughs> when it did a record low rating, the people who just you know decided have to admit that what they were doing it for did not work. Now they won't say that, but you really have to admit that. Yeah, that's true. Failed experiment. There's no two ways about it. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and I mean the buy rate on that pay per view was uh, was real bad, yeah. and uh, you know, and that was because they didn't, you know, they changed their plans every week, but the they wanted to swerve people into having David Arquette beat Tank Abbott and go into the pay per view as world champion to swerve people, and they swerved themselves into I think the second or third lowest buy rate in the history of the company. So who swerved who? Yeah, that's right. I have a question for. Um, well, it's for both of you guys, or is Brian there? Yeah, yeah, so, Brian's here. Okay, so for three of you, uh, Jared or Jericho, who would you build your promotion around? Me, I, I think Jericho's got more charisma than than Jared, I, and I like I, I like Jared. I just don't think I, I don't think both of them I don't think both of them are world champions yet to me, but I think that Jericho's closer than Jared because of the charisma factor. Yeah. Yeah, I would have to go along with that, and I, and I think you know, I think right now, and and this is no disrespect to Jeff Jarrett, he's worked his butt off, uh, he's given him everything, he's, I mean, you know, he's put his butt out there on the line and worked hard, but I think in terms of heat, he's exactly where he's going to go. Uh, you know, I don't think they're, I, I don't think they can build the, the territory around him, no matter how hard they try, but I think in the future uh, with Jericho, that is a possibility. Mm. Ryan, your turn. <laughs> I mean, I would go with uh, I would go with Jericho. I mean, there's something about Jared. I mean, he's a solid worker, and he's he's really old school. But I mean, when you watch him, it's almost like you don't see a guy that's state of the art. I mean, I see him going for. Uh, he's done this a couple of times. It's like he's going for a Frankenstein or he gets a power bomb. And I always think, when has Jeff Jarrett ever did a Frankenstein in his life? <laughs> Never. And I don't know if you know that affects anybody else the way it affects me. But I just look at Jared as is a mid-carter for that very reason. He just doesn't seem like, you know, a state-of-the-art 90s or, uh, I guess, new millennium wrestler who uh, could get up there and hold the world title. You know, to me, to me, one of the things about the world title, and I guess it's, you know, unless probably, you know, from that same era of when the world champion was, you know, the, the guy. Right. You know, and, I mean, he held it for years, and, you know, frivolous guys didn't win the world title in the 70s. I mean, if you look at the guys who held it, you know, you had... Hall of Fame wrestlers, Harley Race, Dory Funk Jr., Jack Briscoe, Terry Funk, Hall of Fame wrestlers, and those are like the only guys who really held it for the most part the whole decade of the 70s. And to me, when I look at, at, at a world champion, he should be that caliber where you stood up, where you stand up above your peers rather than just a guy. Even someone like DDP, just as an example, who I, you know, works really hard. He is a good worker. He is over. But to me, I don't see him, I don't see him as a world champion. It's really weird. Even at 51, and I don't know what it is, um, Ric Flair is, is very close to that. And the only reason he wouldn't be all the way there is, 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 the, is the age of 51. I mean, there's something about, I don't know, it's the aura when he stands in the ring. He looks like, a, he looks like somebody special. You just notice him. And whereas Jarrett looks like just, an, you know, when Jarrett was out there, you know, he just looks like just another pro wrestler. And he's a damn good yeah. one. You know, you, you mentioned that, and this is something that I've always, I say, you know, when we're sitting around our, our gym here talking about, uh, you know, when they're saying, you know, telling the old man to tell some stories so we don't have to train so hard. Uh, one of the things that I always said about Luthez and Buddy Rogers, I mean, two totally different styles, obviously, but you could be in a room with your back to the door, and when either one of these guys walked into the room, you something told you to turn around, there was something special in that room. And Fez and Rogers were, were that kind of people. And I think the guys you're talking about are the same way. 
And, and I think I don't, you know, I don't care what anybody says. There's a foundation to this business, a formula. I mean, you can do pyro, you can do TNA, you can do soap operas, vignettes. I don't care. Uh, there's a basis to this business that hasn't changed in the 40 years I've been in. It's not going to change in the next 40. Uh, quit trying to reinvent it. I think you know the world title is, uh, you know, mythical or not, it's an important prop in your promotion. And I think uh, whether they think it's been hurt or not, I think it's been terribly hurt. And by switching it um, on a weekly basis, it's not going to do anything to, to rejuvenate it. Um, last question. Mm -hmm. um, how would you handle uh, Angle from now? I mean, would you, do you think it would be smart to give him a title push, you know, like a heavyweight title push uh, by the end of this year, or you would still wait Kurt Angle? Yeah. 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 I, I, I think Angle has, needs more experience before he, he gets to that point because I think the one thing, the, David just mentioned Ray Briscoe, Funk, Funk, uh, Flair, there's one common thread that runs through all these people besides what we're else we're talking about. They can elevate somebody else's game. They can take different style wrestlers and conform to their style and perform with them. And I don't think Kurt has enough. I, I think he's got the potential for all that. I just don't think he has enough experience to do that at this point in time. I think, I think some of the comedy skits they did recently kind of sidetracked him, too. Also, I think it's just a rush. I don't think a guy two years in, you know, I mean, I think that he should be, you know, I think that when, a guy, when, when the fans kind of get the impression that a guy should be world champion, I think that he should probably, to me, shouldn't be world champion then for another six to nine months because the, the, you got to make him really want it bad before you give it to him. Sure. Rather than rather than like like once the people kind of figure out, hey, wait a minute, you know this guy's world championship caliber, then that's when you start building it rather than try to shove him down the throat and give him a belt to get him over. Because to me, you know, it's like when you give the guy a belt to get him over, all it does is take the belt down. Right. Exactly. And I think that world title thing, you know, uh, in the past, that's always been the case. It was the plum that was hung up there. Uh, well, I'll tell you, a guy who was red hot as a young baby face who all the grandmothers and the little 14-year-old girls loved and would cry if he was getting his can kicked, and they gave him a title and took it away from him in a short period of time back in the 70s, and basically, as far as I'm concerned, killed a lot of his heat, and that was Tommy Rich. Yeah. You know, yeah, as long as he was the... The queen cut baby face fighting to get there, and he never quite attained it. But once they gave him that belt and then took it off of him in just a matter of days, I think that took a lot of the steam right out of him. He was never he was never the same. No, he, absolutely he, he was not. Hurt by that. You know, and he and I discussed that uh, at one point uh, back in the '80s, and he mis uh, mistaken what I said to think that he never. I said, "No, Tommy, I don't mean you." But I said, "Your style blend more to being the contender." The guy chasing the, the bad champ, the heel champion, opposed to being, you know, because a lot of times with a good, with a good, that type of baby face, once they attain the high level they can go, then that mystique that uh, the fans are, are following is gone. You know, they've achieved what you've been hoping they'll achieve, and once they have, there's nothing left to fight for. Okay, let's go to our last caller get, right now. How you doing? Hello? Yeah, yeah, go ahead. We've got to make it oh, real hey, quick. Hey, We're like running a long time. Hey, how you doing? Oh, I, was, I just want, want to ask you, um, who do you think is the best, the best two people that can carry an Iron Match match today? Um, well, I, mean, I, could, I could do, okay, U.S., because the Japanese, they're Japanese guys who are probably the two best. Yeah, Masao um, Kobashi, I think. Yeah, Masao Kobashi. Kobashi. I would say Masao yeah. Kobashi, too. Brent and ben. Um, well, you know, David, you're you're more attuned to what's going on in the Orient than I would. But here currently, right off the top of my head, without thinking twice, Malenko and Ben Wagwa, I'd give you 60 tomorrow. Are you serious? Yeah, it'd be, it'd be tough, though. It'd be tough for them. It, you know what would be tough for them is, is to, um, they could do it, but I don't know if, you know, you'd have to get them over enough to where the people would want to see it. I mean, it'd, be a, it'd probably be a phenomenal match. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I can't see Malenko because he, he can't get a, he can't get that much crowd heat. Not as much as Benoit. He's not he that can't much get water. Sorry, I missed that. I see well, Malenko he, can't, can't get that much crap crowd heat. It can he? Sometimes it's hard. I mean, it's, I've seen him like with Sky Tuhati, he did a hell of a job. But that was not a 60-minute match either. I know. They'd lose that. And, David, you you noticed what a lot of the fans did. You know, some of my kids came me and said, boy, Scotty and Dean had a hell of a match. 
I said, yes, Dean carried him well, didn't he? Yeah. <laughs> a lot of people didn't notice, but I mean, not, which is not to take anything away from Scott, but uh, yeah, Dean elevated him, and I and I think that's that's the thing with Malenko. Yeah, he probably I, don't get me wrong when I said those two guys automatically been won Malenko. I didn't mean that they're going to stri- uh, draw a uh, record buy rate or anything like that. But I mean, in terms of talent, you know, mechanical skills, those two guys can go out and give you sixty. I I would think every night, just like Flair or or Funk or uh, Harley could have. Yeah, we are we are totally out of time. As far as that question goes, I think it'd be hard for anyone today to do sixty, and we're going to see. But I think, it's, it, it, you know, like I just think it would be so hard because thirty is is a marathon today. Yeah, twenty is a super long match. So sixty is like double is like doing two marathons in the same day. And I, I don't know. We're gonna we're gonna learn a lot about American wrestling fans on Sunday uh, because 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 they are the two most over guys except for Austin in the business. And they are good workers. They've never done this before, and uh, we'll see how the crowd reacts to it. Maybe, maybe it'll be a big surprise. Can I throw a plug in here for a couple websites for Pillman and Hildebrand? Yeah, make it real quick. Okay, PillmanShow.com, Hilde, uh, BrianHildebrand.com, HWAonline.com. They're all linked. Uh, join us next uh, Wednesday for the Fantasy Camp. Give us a call, 513-771-1650. Or for the Pillman on the 25th, and David, look forward to seeing you next week. Yeah, I look forward to seeing you, and don't forget, uh, we'll be back here tomorrow at 6. Thanks very much, Brian. Thanks, Les.